Hello, I'm John Weisslein. No, no, I'm sorry. You can actually direct your initial opening comments oh, okay. directly to the camera, okay. and then, uh, and then. Turn, turn. Okay. Uh, Hello, I'm John Weisslein, and this is, today is April 28, 2000. This is the first in a series of talks that are going to be recorded on video with some of the older citizens of the society and also of the town of Longwood. And we're, we'll be talking a little bit about the early history of Longwood and also of the society. This, is a, this interview is being recorded by Lee Taylor, who is a member of our society, who will be doing the whole series for us. And today we are in the Bradley McIntyre House here in the uh, historic Longwood. I want to say a little bit about myself. I was born here in Longwood. I'm sorry, I don't want to talk. That, uh, the truck was killing us. Oh, okay. Uh, a, a bit about myself. I was born here in Longwood in the historic district in 1928. And I lived here for about four years or five years. And in 19... I was born in 1923, I'm sorry. In 1928, we moved uh, about three quarters of a mile east of here uh, on what is uh, now 434. At that time, it was uh, the Longwood Obita Road. And I was raised there, and I stayed around Longwood uh, and went to, graduated from Lyman High School, went to Rollins College, graduated in 1944, which time I left. Uh, return, returning about every two years to visit my folks who lived in the area. And then in 1983, uh, my wife and I moved back to Longwood to live permanently. And that is when I first became interested in the society. But before we talk about the society, Lee, let me tell you a little bit about what Longwood was like that I've heard from my ancestors who lived here. Uh, I'm a direct descendant of Mr. Josiah Clouser, who came to Longwood around 1882. Um, my father also came to Longwood early on, about 1910. Uh, a little bit about what Mr. Clouser's uh, lore has come down to us. They arrived here in Longwood uh, to work on the hotel at the request of Mr. Hank, and he was my great grandfather was a master builder, and Mr. Hank hired him to supervise the building of his hotel. Uh, at that time, Longwood already had one hotel called the Longwood Hotel, and a number of buildings that had gone up around the square. This area had been opened up to settlers originally about 1840. However, the earliest known settler in this region right here was the Hartley family who came just before 1870. Mr. Hank did not arrive until about 1874, at uh, which time he homesteaded this area and laid it out, platted it for a town. And he was obviously an uh, entrepreneur from Boston who planned to make his living by selling property here in the town. Uh, he soon was able to get a post office route through here, and then he named the town Longwood after a subdivision in Boston in which he had worked early on. Uh, Longwood started to fill up rather rapidly during the 18, latter, latter part of the 1870s, and uh, it was a largely a town that was a mill town for lumber because the place was filled up with all sorts of... Uh, native pine that had never been cut, and it was provided a great source of lumber, both uh, pine and cypress. Uh, Mr. Hank was successful in starting a railroad to come through here uh, in 1880. He was a member of uh, the team along with uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rand. Uh, who was also living here in Longwood at that time, came from Boston, and Mr. Haskell from Maitland, uh, who set up the railroad to go through here from Sanford to Orlando. Once the railroad came through, people could come to Sanford on the boat from Jacksonville and then head south 
along the line and the area developed very rapidly, not only for tourists in the wintertime, but also it was a means for getting the produce that the people raised, the lumber, and things like that out to uh, up and down the line and up to Sanford. The railroad was completed to Tampa three years later in 1883, and <clears throat> in 1886, the railroad came from Jacksonville to Sanford, and then we were hooked up to uh, essentially the rest of the country. Uh, it was 44 hours at that time from New York City to this area, and so it was prime area for tourists. But uh, Longwood did not really go in for tourists too much. Uh, it was more of a center here for this whole area. It had doctors and lawyers, uh, plenty of real estate people, of course the post office. It was uh, a couple of general stores that catered to all the people who lived in the area. Uh, there were dry goods stores, there was a millinery shop, uh, all the things that you might find in a small settlement that uh, catered to the area for 10 miles around or maybe 5 miles around each off on all sides. So it was sort of the center for this whole area which was rapidly becoming a large citrus area. People came from all over to establish citrus groves after the timber was cut. Uh, it was a fine area for citrus. And Longwood grew rapidly. Uh, in 1885 there was about a thousand citizens here in Longwood, making their living one way or the other, off of each other essentially, and uh, lumber and citrus being the main staples of the, uh, commerce. Uh, this continued until 1895 when the freeze essentially wiped out all the citrus in the area, and instead of replanting <coughs> right away, uh, most of the people simply moved back to where they came from. They sold off what they had uh, and just sort of abandoned their houses and their farms and moved away. So Longwood shrank rapidly and, uh, at that time. and I think around the turn of the century there were probably maybe three, four hundred people in the area, no more than that. Uh, John, this, can, uh, yeah. Back up just a little bit and uh, uh, clarify uh, the hotel. Oh, business. the hotel situation. Yeah, yeah. because you, yeah. You, you said there wasn't much of a tourist economy, and yet this is a fairly uh, respectably large hotel, and you know a little yes. bit about that. Well, um, there were several hotels. The original hotel that was called the Longwood Hotel burnt in uh, 1890, I believe. So this hotel was essentially built to provide a focus point for the whole town. Uh, it was popular not only with people who came through and people who wanted to stay here, uh, but it was a center for the town and uh, generally on Saturday nights uh, everybody came into the town and there was a, always a meal and a dance at the hotel. So <clears throat> it was really big enough to be the focal point for the, the city. People coming through on the train could see the hotel. It was just a block off of the uh, uh, railroad. And so between the railroad station, which was right there, and the hotel, it sort of formed a nucleus for downtown, where all the stores were, the livery stable, the post office, and all those things were sort of gathered around what we would call uh, now uh, the Church Street, the railroad, and uh, 427, uh, County Road 427, or at that time known as Lake Avenue. And uh, of course they were not paved, they were just dirt roads, and uh, all of the area was dirt roads at that time. Well, what about the architecture of the hotel? Anything significant? Or uh, it's typical of what was being built all the way through Florida. It was the late Victorian architecture, and the hotel today is simply a replica of what was built almost everywhere except this is one of the smaller hotels that were built. The one in Aldemont was bigger and certainly the ones in Winter Park were much larger. When we think of Victorian architecture, we think of a lot of uh, foo-foo and frills. Well, um, the Florida we Victorian, especially in this central area, seems to be very, very uh, modest in that. 
Yes, we were right at the end of the Victorian era, and uh, things were changing uh, very rapidly at that time. Uh, the um, furniture had gotten very plain. Uh, we had a back to nature, back to uh, being plain in all the things we do. We passed through the very fancy area of the Victorian age, and we were just on the latter end of it, so that uh, things were much plainer at that time than the, than the real Victorian. If it had been built 30 years uh, sooner, or maybe even 20 years sooner, it would have been much more Victorian looking of what we think of like the Saratoga style or something like that than, than what is being built at the time when these places were built. Do you think the, the, the lack of available uh, uh, craftsmen uh, had any impact on the, the uh, frugality of well, the style? Well, I don't really know. It, it's possible. Uh, Mr. Clouser, after he supervised the building of the hotel, uh, became the foreman for Mr. DeMenn's mill shop, uh, he had lumber, and uh, they were turning out all sorts of uh, moldings and things like that to go in the houses around here because, uh, as I understand it, the DeMenn's mill here in Longwood was perhaps the main uh, source of all sorts of mill work for this whole area. Is it possible that the Brad Mack House, which is a Florida cottage Victorian had uh, part of the uh, implements here, part of the, the woodwork and things are from the Longwood Mill? Is that oh yes, it's thought so. It's also thought that Mr. Clouser was the builder of the stairs. Apparently Mr. Clouser specialized in building stairs and uh, what, from what we've been told in recent years, many of the homes in, in this whole area around here, uh, Mr. Clouser was employed to build the stairs. There's a rather unusual staircase in the Bradley Mack House. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, uh, it's nicely designed. It goes up uh, in t two landings. It goes up uh, part way, goes up again another landing, and then goes up to the second floor. Uh, the one in the hotel across here is a double staircase. goes up on each side of the lobby uh, and comes together on the halfway up, and then there's uh, another staircase, a uh, single staircase that goes from the second floor on up to the, uh, from the first floor on up to the second floor. So the staircases are quite uh, fancy and are, are part of uh, the decor of all the buildings that were built at that time. Um, to go on a little bit more about the history, the uh, as I say, the town was laid out on both sides of the railroad track. It built up on both sides of the railroad track, though the east side of the town extended as far as what is now Millwee Street, uh, on the west side, I'm sorry, uh, out uh, essentially two blocks. Across the railroad track, it extended down maybe uh, to the east, uh, three or four blocks on that side. Uh, the mill, of course, was on... Uh, that side of the uh, railroad track, on the east side of the railroad track. And uh, most of the business uh, centered uh, right around the railroad track. Um, there was a section of Longwood known as West Longwood that started out uh, on uh, what was a Longwood Markham Road at that time, which is now Church Street, that began about where West Lake is now, to the north of that road and extended out and what would be the center of West Longwood, I think, was at, would be now at the intersection of Range Line Road and Church Street. And that was uh, essentially uh, West Longwood, where a lot of people lived in Longwood. They had their own little community. They had a community building there and seemed to be quite separate at that time from Longwood proper. Just why, I don't know. And, and only a mile apart. And only a mile apart. But they were a separate identity, and they, as I say, they had their own little meeting house, and it was known as West Longwood. Um, as I, I guess I had gotten through the big freeze and said Longwood had gone back. Then 
Longwood had another revival during the 1920s when we had the boom town, or the boom era in Longwood. And uh, a lot of land all around Longwood then was uh, surveyed and platted in various uh, subdivisions that were just on the edge of the old Longwood, and so they extended it on out. Uh, Longwood itself went from being a wooden village, uh, all the stores being wood, uh, to a brick and cement block uh, business district. At a bank came in at that time. There was a bank, and yeah, we're talking now about just about the time I first started to remember what was here in Longwood. There was a uh, at that time uh, there was a hardware store, Mr. Payne's Hardware Store. And we had a separate little building for the post office. It was just on the other side of Payne's store toward the railroad track. And of course, there was a depot. Which, and then uh, along with the bank, there was a drug store, Doc Reynolds Drug Store. Uh, then was Mr. Jackson's store. Uh, there was an, at least one other store in there. Mr. Gray had a barber shop. And then on the south end of that building, was another little building, and that was Mr. Baker's uh, restaurant. And there was a nice little restaurant there that prospered uh, well into the middle of the Depression, actually. But all during the uh, time of the uh, boom times, we saw the roads paved. The uh, road from Sanford to Orlando had been pretty much paved by 1920. Oh, it, it's the quick one. It's the Amtrak. Um, question I might have about uh, uh, the surrounding area, how Longwood was uh, different or similar to, you know, Sanford and Altamont and mm -hmm. Maitland and okay. Orlando. Just, just a, you know, kind of an overview. I mean, the mm -hmm. like from the freeze or whatever. Um. I really don't know much about Longwood during during that period. The whole area was scrambling to see what they could do. Uh, during uh, that period, Sanford went essentially from being uh, an orange place. It developed all sorts of truck farming, which eventually went into the celery business. As you know, Sanford was the celery capital of the world oh, from about 1920 up to 1920. Well, through the war in 1944 or something like that. Uh, Longwood just shrank. Uh, I don't, there was some poultry business around here, uh, but in general it was just a, a small community. Aldemont, uh, again, primarily a winter community, uh, didn't have many residents, and uh, up until uh, the uh, Fernery business came to Aldemont. Uh, it was strictly a winter uh, town, and it filled up nicely in the winter time with people coming to the hotel there. I think Winter Park was much the same. It was essentially a winter town with ex uh, just a few people living there to keep the place going during the summertime. Uh, of course, uh, Sanford had the boats coming in, and Orlando continued to grow. And, um, Certainly all during my childhood, uh, Orlando was a place to go shopping people. You could shop in Sanford, but uh, even then, people from Sanford went to Orlando to do their serious shopping, I think. Uh, but all during the boom time, Longwood was a, uh, being halfway between Sanford and Orlando proved to be a very uh, uh, good place for people to locate. We had the a golf course located here, San Lando Golf Course. Uh, and we also had the dog track come uh, in the early 20s. And out beyond that, at the end of Semaran, was the horse track, which was also built and for a year or two had uh, more mutual betting on uh, saddle horses out there. Uh, it soon uh, turned into just a track that people used during the winter time to winter their horses here. And uh, 
Later on, of course, it was a harness racing track for a number of years, but that was even um, after the 1940s. Uh, but to go back, uh, the roads came through in the 20s. Uh, the uh, main road through town was called either the Dixie Highway or the Black Bear Trail, depending on which uh, trail or uh, route that you were touting at the time. <coughs> The uh, road from Longwood to Markham and up to 46 was paved uh, during the boom times. The road from Grant Avenue or uh, Warren Avenue here was paved all the way out to Sandland of Springs uh, when it became here after it became a dirt road. And in 1928, the road from Longwood. Uh, which from uh, 427 was paved all the way to Oviedo. And in 1928, uh, we moved uh, down on 427, on uh, the Longwood Oviedo Road. And I can remember one of the first memories of moving there was the people paving the road. And they, it was still a road that was being paved using uh, horses and uh, machinery pulled by horses together with some uh, trucks, uh, motor trucks. But uh, I remember very distinctly he, uh, my brother, who was a couple years younger, picked up a little piece of leather strap from out on the road where they had the horses. And he called that his horsey. So I know that they were used, remember that, because they were using horses. Now when, when you say paved, were they uh, not actually uh, bricking? No. Um, the road from Sanford to Orlando had been a brick road, but the roads from uh, Longwood out were uh, limestone with a macadam top to them and gravel on top of the macadam. But but the Dixie Highway itself was a brick road, road. originally. Yes. And, and from what? How long did that date? To can you place the well, bricking of that? Yes, uh, that was around 1970. The road was built. Uh, th that road was built in about 1970. That must have been an enormous job. I mean, the, those are huge, big road brick, and there are literally hundreds of thousands of yes. them to cover that 20 miles. But it wasn't very wide. <laughs> it was only maybe eight feet wide at the most. It was a one-lane road, and uh, if you met somebody coming, which I guess wasn't very often, you just sort of pulled over, and one wheel went on the, uh, the dirt along the side, because it was strictly a one-lane road. Um, I can remember my father saying that there was a garage on here in Longwood on the corner of uh, 427 and Warren Avenue on the southwest corner. And there was a telephone there. And when it was first in use, or maybe before it was in use, as a, um, I guess while it was still a dirt road, there were automobiles in the area. People would call back from Longwood to tell wherever they started from, either Sanford or Orlando. They'd gotten halfway and tell them how many flat tires they'd had on the way or something like that. So uh, we did have telephones. Electricity didn't come to the town until 1918. There was a, a gener generator built in Aldemont to serve both the towns in 1918. And time, uh, up until that time, it, the streets had been lit with oil lamps, uh, kerosene lights. They uh, hired a boy to come around and uh, fill the lamps every evening with enough uh, kerosene to last from where dark to midnight. And so every night he'd refill them and light the lamps. And, uh, I never was able to determine how many lamps there really were in Longwood, but there were ones, I guess, at most of the intersections, uh, main intersections on town. Maybe a dozen lights or something like that. Since, uh, since pine trees, and especially the old, old mm -hmm. growth pine, uh, was so abundant here, there must have been turpentine businesses. Uh, was that not a, was that not a uh, uh, stable of the local economy or? Turpentining uh, was 
here. But I think most of the turpentining came on the second growth pine, and that was during the 20s. There was a lot of turpentining in all areas uh, during the 1920s. Uh, Geneva had a lot. Uh, there were uh, also out at uh, Markham. There was a turpentine mill here in Longwood, down right about where 427 and Dog Track Road are now. And there was a turpentine mill there during the 20s. But I have not heard anything much about turpentining during the early days. It was mostly timber that was cut, at least that you hear about. But there were turpentining mills around or turpentining, turpentining places. I'm not aware of them. Uh, even in the early days of Seminole County, most of the turpentining that that book talks about occurred during the late teens and the 20s. Any so, spectacular incidents, fires or anything? that Not uh, that uh, are recorded that I know anything about. But there was a major fire in Longwood that destroyed a good part of it. Uh, it would, well, the hotel was destroyed by the old hotel. The, the first original. Longwood hotel was destroyed by a fire around 19... 1890, as I believe, and maybe a little bit after that. And uh, homes burned, Mr. DeMent's home burned um, in, uh, at the turn of the century. It was out on East, uh, East Lake, that burned. Uh, but uh, most of the homes that are still standing here in Longwood uh, are, uh, date back to the turn of the century. So uh, fire did not ever destroy the whole town of Longwood. Um, a lot of uh, buildings in Sanford were destroyed in the big fire, but that, they were much closer together. And after the fires went through, uh, a lot of places were, re were rebuilt with brick that had been... Uh, when the brick buildings were put in here in Longwood, I think the wooden buildings that were there must have been torn down at that time because there were all wooden buildings along there, stores and things like that. And uh, they all disappeared before I was around. Uh, Payne's store, uh, which was is between the railroad tracks at 427 on the north side of the road, is still there. That's a wooden building. Uh, <coughs> uh, as I say, the brick buildings were here. As far as I know, there were no major fires in Longwood uh, after I was around. Is the, um, is the uh, building now that is uh, uh, the lawnmower uh, facility mm -hmm. yeah. with, the, with the cafe, is that the original depot? Is that no, the depot uh, no longer exists. The depot was on the south side of Church Street right along the railroad track. And it was taken down in the, um, probably around 1960 and was moved to a place up near Ocala, which was planning to put together a early, rare, uh, early community with a railroad station. And it was set up there, and that went defunct, and the railroad station now is a home uh, up near Jacksonville. It's, it actually still exists. It consisted of a, a freight and express room, there was uh, two waiting rooms, one for the black and one for the white. <coughs> and then there was the uh, station master's uh, office and ticket, where he sold tickets. And it had little uh, uh, bowls that went out onto the platform so he could sit there and look out and see the trains coming. And of course, he was a telegraph operator. And so if any messages for the trains came through, uh, he would get it on the telegraph machine and, uh, and then take it out. And if the train was stopping here, hand it to the engineer or if it was going through, he'd put it on one of the sticks and that had the hoop on the end and the fireman would hold his arm out the uh, window of the cab and run his hand through the hoop and pull the message in and tell him where to get off on sightings and things like that uh, if they had to uh, get onto a sighting. 
And of course, he also took uh, messages uh, or telegraph uh, messages when they came in. They weren't very frequent in those days because I think, uh, in general, telegraph at that time was used for births and deaths. Uh, that was about the sum and substance of the telegrams that came into Longwood. Uh, the, the train, however, was a frequent occurrence. The, the short tracks and several other short lines that ran from the mill to the main tracks, this was a, we, we don't see that today because the train only comes through maybe half a dozen, ten times a day now, but it must have ran fairly regularly. Well, they ran a local between around, uh, and it went uh, twice a day, I guess, and then there was the uh, main passenger train that came through, and there were crates that came through, and they came through pretty much on time. Now, originally, uh, there had been a track that came down uh, Bay Street here that was essentially a logging track that went to the mill. Then, uh, a couple blocks north, there was uh, another railroad, whose name escapes me at the moment, that uh, <clears throat> was originally going from Lake Jessup to uh, Apopka and then on down to Kissimmee. Uh, it ran <clears throat> for a few years from uh, Longwood to Kissimmee through Apopka, but they never were able to get uh, a right of way across the other track was here, they wouldn't give them a right of way. So it was never completed all the way over to Lake Jessup. Although the roadbed was laid, it was, uh, when I was a young person, you could uh, see where the roadbed went through, uh, all through the woods over on, where the, <clears throat> when they cut through for 1792, you could see exactly where they cut through the roadbed over there. And I guess, <coughs> excuse me, I guess if you, uh, Go over here a couple of blocks on the east side of the Pleasant Railroad track. If you know where to look, you can see uh, some of the railroad bed from, and I cannot think of the name of the railroad at that point, this particular time. And of course, the Orange Belt Railway was built out west, so it did not impact Longwood directly. It was more of a road from Lake Monroe uh, through the western part of the county down through Forest City and over around the south side of Lake Apopka, which was extended on to uh, uh, St. Petersburg eventually. And that was Mr. DeMent's railroad. That essentially broke him. He had to sell his mill and everything else to try and pay off some of the debts. And of course, at that time, the family moved from here to North Carolina and subsequently out to California he was again successful. And <clears throat> people down in St. Petersburg, for which uh, town was named for Mr. DeMenn's hometown, have taken on Mr. DeMenn's in, um, well, he's much more popular in St. Petersburg than he ever was in Longwood, apparently, and uh, they still have uh, festivals for Mr. DeMenz down there. And we, of course, now have a marker for Mr. DeMenz, which makes it very nice that we do honor Mr. DeMenz in that respect, because certainly when he was running the mill here, he was by far the largest employer in the town. There's no question about that. And uh, he had lumber crews out in the woods cutting lumber, and he obviously had a crew here at the running his uh, sawmill. Would he, uh, could we say that, uh, or would it be proper to say that uh, Mr. DeMenz was the single most influential person as far as the, as far as the development of Longwood as a? No, you'd have to say Mr. Hank was uh, the most influential person in getting Longwood going. Uh, I think uh, during its early heydays, it was certainly helped by Mr. DeMenz putting his sawmill here, building his home here, but he didn't uh, really take so much interest in Longwood. He was much more interested in his railroad entrepreneuring and things like that. Once he got his uh, 
sawmill going, and he'd only been here a couple of years when he got his sawmill going, and was able to sell ties and things like that to the railroads, and the Orange Belt Railway defunct. And he bought up the charter for that. Then he was really uh, into the railroad business. And, uh, I don't think he spent a great deal of time here in Longwood. Uh, he was more off uh, raising money and building his railroad. Longwood was not his primary, I'm sure of that, uh, his railroad business. Where Mr. Hank, throughout the years, consistently uh, pumped Longwood, advertised Longwood, uh, was a real estate agent, was one of the real estate agents here over many years. And so you'd have to say that Mr. Hank was really the prime mover of Longwood. He got the hotels built, and uh, he uh, promoted various which I don't think Mr. Demens really did, other than have his sawmill here, and probably for the few years to take, that it took him to get it started, and I'm talking now maybe three years, he probably really was interested in all of it. Once the railroad business caught his eye, and he was really a railroad an entrepreneur after that. The Clousers, uh, your ancestors, played... Uh, uh, no small part in Well, in Mr. Longwood. Clouser, along with several other people, were very prominent. Mr. Clouser uh, was uh, on the town council after it was uh, uh, incorporated in 1883. He was on the town council. He was mayor at least three times over the following 16 or 17 years, and I think stayed on the council. We know he was one of the founders and first president of the Cemetery Association here, along with uh, four or five other prominent people here in town. So he was very active in the town uh, throughout his life here, and he lived up until, I think, uh, 1917 or something like that. So during that time, he was, yes, very prominent in the town. And of course, his son-in-law, Mr. Niemeyer, ran a general store here in town, and they were prominent people, and his home is still standing. Warren Street, at Mr. Clouser's house on Warren Street, and his cottage over on uh, Church Street. So, yes, they were very prominent people here in Longwood. A lot of people lived out of ways that were very prominent. The Circes, who lived just outside of town, really in West Longwood, who were very prominent. Uh, a lot of people in West Longwood were also prominent here in town, though they didn't live right downtown, but they worked here. And When one thinks of, uh, of uh, settlers, even though this isn't the, yeah. exactly the pioneer version of settler, although it was similar, um, one usually thinks of uh, farmer type uh, agri orientation, uh, people that are, are really trying to stake a claim uh, in, in literally the dirt and get started. But this uh, area is settled by a much more, uh, almost, uh, I don't want to say aristocracy, but a, a much more... Professional type people. Yeah, the, yeah. these are from, uh, these people were from Boston, from New York, from uh, New England, is that correct? Uh, uh, well-educated. Pennsylvania, relatively well-educated. Uh, professionals. Professionals. Not all of them, but uh, a lot of them were. And... Uh, they, there were some farming, of course. There were uh, poultry business here, pigeon business, uh, and some cattle farming around, uh, or cattle business. But generally, it was uh, professional type buildings. Mr. Overstreet down here, uh, right on the other side of uh, the tracks, uh, was a contractor. He was in the road building business. Uh, there were people who ran filling stations and that type of thing, which didn't depend on farming. Uh, there were people here who owned orange groves and depended on selling citrus for their thing, but there, there were no truck farming particularly in this area. Sanford was largely truck farming, uh, supported Sanford, and, uh, all, all around Sanford. Uh, but but that, seem, that, that seems a little 
atypical. It, it's not your typical scenario. That's For correct. instance, the house that we're uh, sitting in today, the Bradley uh, McIntyre house, the original owner, uh, operator, or builder. Uh, Wealthy Boston. Wealthy Boston. And Mr. A name we'll all recognize, Mr. Westinghouse. Yes. Was the original owner motivator. Of a, right. a similar building like this he had there. His house was a mirror image of this house. It's burned, but uh, he had a mirror image. He was a promoter. Uh, all wealthy Bostonians. Uh, Aldemont uh, was advertised as a Bostonian community. And uh, most of the people originally came from Boston. They, of course, friends of theirs gradually moved in uh, to the area. But it was essentially a Boston town, largely occupied only in the wintertime, when the population probably tripled or something like that. Uh, Longwood had some tourists. It had the main section, which is right over uh, south of 427 here on the left-hand side, where a number of main tourists came. They had homes there. Uh, probably 10 or 12 families moved in, in the wintertime uh, from, from Maine, and they contributed to the uh, tourist season here in Longwood, as I remember it. And they all had their homes built by the time I came on. So, uh, but anyway, I thought I'd move on to tell you a little bit about the society now. If, uh, let, me, let me just double check and make sure that we're still Everything is cooking here. Okay, we're at about 42 minutes. Let me see, the framing looks, uh, looks okay. You, you, you've uh, gone down just a tiny, tiny bit on me here, and I'll just readjust that. I think we're good. Look at me once there, John, just for, okay, that's good. Yeah, I think we're all right, and we are still recording. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, <coughs> let me tell you a little bit about what I know about the society. Uh, I was first introduced to the society in 1984, early in 1984, by my brother and my sister-in-law, Fred and Carolyn Weisslein. And uh, I joined the society, and it proved... Uh, something I was interested in, and I had just retired, so I had perhaps more time than uh, many other people to devote to the society, but it was a going society. It uh, was paying for itself by the time we joined. It was no longer uh, living from hand to mouth. Uh, it had just come out of that era, however, and there will be other people who can tell, you, will tell us more about that. But it was a viable society by the time I joined. And the people who were prominent at that time were the Venables, Myra and Dick. Uh, Grace Bradford, who of course with her husband had given the property here and who had taken a very strong interest in the house and getting it furnished and things like that. Lillian Miller, who was very active in, uh, I won't say coercing, but at least making the fact that the house needed furniture known. And uh, people moved down here with furniture too big for the house. Why uh, Lillian was always there to suggest that they might be given to the house, and which it was. Uh, the ha uh, Hammonds, Bob and Joanna, and Julie Stanick, I think, was president when I came. And uh, all very interested in the house. and. Uh, most of them uh, in, the, in running the festival. The festival had been established and was a much smaller uh, festival than we know today. It had maybe 100 or uh, just a little over 100 uh, booths set up. Uh, I'm told that <clears throat> the first festival had been in the lot directly across from the house here and that people came. There weren't any assigned places the first festival. They just moved over to the lot and set up their uh, tables wherever they uh, wanted to. By the time I came, the festival had extended all the way down uh, Warren Street. Uh, 
past uh, the next street down, uh, Wilma Street, and uh, was all around the hotel. Uh, also uh, down on Wilma Street from Church Street over to uh, Bay Street. Uh, and it remained that size. We began to get a waiting list. And uh, I think the second year we were here, the clerks, um, Barbara and Peter, ran the festival. And they uh, were very energetic and worked very hard, built the festival up. And it was probably a little bigger that year. Then uh, the following year, the festival uh, had a waiting list, quite a large waiting list. And uh, I remember that Julie Stanick had told us that, well, you can send out all the uh, application blanks on the waiting list uh, because only about half the people on the waiting list will uh, an answer you back saying they want a booth. However, the year after the Clarks ran the festival, and uh, I was partly associated with it, as was Nancy Fry. We set out uh, over 100 uh, application blanks to people on the waiting list. And right away, all 100 of them came back with, uh, I think, $35, which is what we were charging at that time for a booth. And that was more than we had planned on. And it was in that year that we started extending the festival on down um, uh, Church Street and uh, to both sides of Church Street. Uh, up to that time, there had only been a few booths over on Church Street. But what year, John? This would be about 1985. I'm not quite sure, but 85 or 86 is when the festival really, uh, our waiting list filled up and people on the waiting list really meant they wanted to get into the festival. So we expanded the festival, and it has continued to grow a little bit up until about, uh, oh, uh, 1990, when I think we had uh, about filled everything up that we had, with the exception of lower, um, uh, well, the far end of Warren Avenue. Uh, we did continue to fill up the space across from the Bradley McIntyre House until uh, about 1996 when they started indicating that they were going to start uh, tearing up 427 and uh, turning it into a uh, four-lane divided highway, and that was going to happen almost immediately. So at that time, Nobody was able to assure us that they wouldn't be tearing the thing up uh, six months from the 1st of July when we had to make some decisions. So that was the year, we, I think it was 96, that we decided to move the festival, the people out of, uh, across from the uh, Bradley McIntyre House down to the end of uh, Warren Street. Uh, of course, they didn't build the road then. It was always six months away for the next four years, and we've now seen them start to build it finally. But uh, that was a false alarm that uh, we were naive enough to believe. Actually, however, uh, the early, very early on, the uh, county was able to pick up the land across from the Bradley McIntyre house, and once they bought the land, in order for us to deal uh, with the county, we would have had to have uh, essentially double dealing what with the town of Longwood and also with the county. The county has entirely different rules and regulations, insur insurance uh, requirements and things like that with the uh, with societies for using land and things like that. So it would have uh, required a lot more work on the part of the society and the festival people uh, had we decided to try and put uh, booths over there. 
So we lost the front yard. Yeah, we lost the whole yard in front of the uh, hotel. But it was fortuitous, actually, no? I mean... Well, uh, we're going to gain a lot from having the road go through. They've taken the building down between us and 427 so that the society now will have an exposure on 427, which I think will raise our profile a great deal. Um, the society... Uh, continued to grow with the festival. It became very self-sufficient. Uh, uh, we were able to pay off the mortgage uh, uh, in the early 90s. What, what was the original mortgage amount for the house? I think it was around $40,000. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the final mortgage was that we, were paying, that we paid off, but we did uh, succeed in paying off the rest of the mortgage. That was held by Grace Bradford, and it was about $10,000 at the time it was paid off. Uh, the, the remaining amount was uh, the most. Yeah, and was that mostly for the house or the property? That was not for the property. That was mostly for moving the house. Mostly for moving. The house cost us $1. Uh, the land was given free. Uh, all we had to do was pay off for of moving the house, and the main cost of moving the house was with the uh, electric light company, which uh, had to take down the wires and put them back up. And this uh, was very expensive, and uh, public utilities are not allowed to do charitable things, so they were not allowed to give us any break on what it cost to moving the, uh, uh, moving the house, so we had to take that on. Uh, <clears throat> Originally, there was a lot of effort just to pay the monthly bill on the mortgage, but we were able to, during the latter part of the 80s and during the uh, early part of the 90s, we paid off the mortgage, we were able to purchase the land on which the uh, inside-outside house had been placed. Uh, we did own the building, but we didn't own the land, so we were able to take that in. Uh, we also had the house painted, and uh, in the past few years, there's been more upkeep on the house, and uh, we've uh, improved the yard, uh, we put on new roof, and all those things, and the and bought uh, all sorts of things for the house that we needed, like the rugs in the grand salon, the rugs on the stairs, uh, furniture that we were not able to get given or find suitable furniture, antiques, we bought uh, furniture for the uh, men's parlor or the office to make it look like an uh, office. Those things were all part of the things that we've been able to do in the last 10 years. And of course, our next project, as everybody knows, is to start a Museum of Longwood History in the old women's club, which we were given about two years ago in which we need to uh, renovate, and change over so it's suitable for uh, a historic museum, and start collecting artifacts here in Longwood to uh, set up a museum. And, uh, can you, can yeah. you see, uh, or do you think, the present day position of uh, the historical district in Longwood uh, as it is, the city as it is today, uh, would be a lot different if the society had not uh, taken an interest in preserving this, this part of history? Please give me that time, because I don't want you to play with it. Okay. Yes. Um, it wasn't how, just how much moving does, the house. How much, let me re rephrase it. How much does the Long, does Longwood, old Longwood, owe the society? That is a question that somebody else really should answer. I would say that the people who were interested in preserving old Longwood here were also interested in the society. How much the actual formation of the society outside of moving the two houses here to bolster what was already here. But I think it was the help, obviously help, but I think it really was the people 
who lived here in Longwood that had the interest in Longwood that were instrumental in preserving, getting the historic district established and funding it, uh, or getting the city to fund it, uh, were the people who uh, were instrumental with Longwood. And how the train's going to the train's going to yeah. mess this up. But uh, what I what I'm going to ask you is. Uh, uh, as soon as it decides that it can quit blowing the horn. Uh, I'm going to ask you what the, uh, just what the value of uh, having a preserved, uh, we, can, we can actually say early Florida, uh, having an area that's reminiscent of how it, was then, uh, how valuable that is. I mean, I mean, are there play? You know, is this like just something you can drive ten miles in any direction and find something like this, or or is this really something that's special and that a hundred years from now will be irreplaceable, well, if I not think, already? Okay, uh, I think uh, Longwood, the historic district of Longwood, is really unique. It is probably the only small town historic district that exists. Uh, Orlando has uh, certain historic districts, uh, but they were not downtown. Uh, they were on the edge of town, where the wealthy people live. Uh, Sanford has the same thing, and Sanford has a brick downtown. Longwood. I think is unique in that it's the only country town uh, around here that I know of that has a really uh, mix of a few buildings, uh, homes mostly, uh, with uh, a few commercial buildings uh, established in it. Uh, it is becoming more commercial and maybe it has to become commercial in order to preserve itself. I think the character will change. I don't think it will be a, a community uh, like it was uh, back in the 30s, where uh, Bay Street, for instance, was all homes. And you can I can remember that uh, almost everybody that lived up on Bay Street walked down to the post office every afternoon to get their mail, came back by and stopped by, uh, talked to Mrs. Park Parton and Levine property and dropped in to talk to Mrs. Niemeyer on her property up at the corner. And it was uh, a neighborhood where people walked back and forth. Uh, I don't think that necessarily happens much anymore, particularly since the post office left downtown Longwood. Up until the time that the post office was left downtown Longwood, yes, people walked to the post office. You could come down here and go to the post office and meet all your friends who still lived here and walked in. But uh, with the post office moving out of Longwood, I think it uh, lost a lot of its uh, uh, ambience, so to speak, of people living here. Uh, not that the post office wasn't used by people from outside to a great extent, but you could still go down to the post office and meet the Millweeds and uh, uh, Jacksons and people like that. But at least the their mailboxes there and walk to the post office every day. But at least the scenario will be intact. Yes, the scenario will be intact. I think uh, <coughs> uh, we'll see uh, a lot of people using downtown, particularly since if we get the new uh, civic center down here bring lots of people into downtown. I think the shops that would have been little grocery shops and things like that that depended on people driving in uh, for years uh, will can flourish, but there'll be different types of shops. They won't be grocery stores or hardware stores and things like that. They will be boutiques and that type of thing. But I think, yes, they will flourish here in Longwood. The hotel, is uh, now turned into uh, a successful office building. And it's filled up most of the time. And uh, the hotel
Hotel is being kept up by the profits of renting it out. And that's great because if it depended on tourists coming through, I don't think uh, it would uh, survive. Uh, there's not enough people come through here to bed and breakfast, I think, to keep a big place like that going. So the fact that it is a successful building and is profitable is what's keeping it looking like it originally did. Otherwise, I think it would uh, fall in by the wayside one way or the other. So the future of the past is bright. I think so, yes. I think it took the fight. Uh, I'm very encouraged about it. Uh, I think that uh, 10 years from now, the, it will be an entirely more exciting place than it is today. I hope that uh, eventually, that the Bradley McIntyre House will be open at least three days a week, if not four days a week, uh, and become a much bigger attraction than it is now. Uh, the fact that uh, we only open it a couple days a week means that we can't advertise it as part of the uh, things that people ought to do here in Longwood or in this county. Uh, the Museum of Central Florida History, uh, of Seminole County, uh, very shortly, will be open seven days a week. It's open uh, four days a week now. Uh, it'll be open six days a week, I should say, Saturday and Sunday, as well as Monday through Friday. That will be a big boon uh, for the tourist, uh, historic tourist area here in, the, in Seminole County, because they can advertise, come see us Saturday and Sunday before your plane takes off, and things like that, which they will do uh, for the Sanford Orlando Airport. And that's a big boon to tourists in this area. And we have people who come out here shopping. Uh, if they have enough time uh, before their plane takes off or their plane gets delayed. And I think uh, with the Bradley McIntyre House open would be a, a great more pull into Longwood.